Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to this special 500th episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. It's so hard to just wrap my mind around the fact that we're at the 500th episode now. I mean, it seems like just yesterday, August 22nd of 2015, when I aired that first episode, it seems like it was just yesterday. There's a little funny behind the scenes bit of info I'm going to share with you when I aired that episode, when I recorded episode one, of course, I was just getting my feet wet and how I was going to handle things. And I didn't have a digital recorder back then. So (laughs) we recorded that first episode. And then after we wrapped, I went to check on the digital file on the computer and it was gone. So right then and there, I learned the importance of not relying on recording onto the computer, but rather recording right into a digital recorder. Luckily, the guests were nice enough to run it back and redo that whole recording right then and there. If they wouldn't have done that, then I would have really been in a spot. But just some behind the scenes information that I wanted to share with you about what happened with that first episode. Anyway talking about the fact that it's the 500th episode, I can't thank you as the listeners enough for supporting the show the way you have. And by supporting the show, you're not just supporting the show, you're supporting the listeners. If you had a clue how much your support has helped so many eyewitnesses, you just wouldn't believe it. It helps so much more than you're ever going to know, and I can't thank you enough for that. But having said all that, for tonight's show... Tonight's guest has had encounters with dogmen that just might be as intense or more intense than pretty much any encounters that we've aired on this show. I mean, when you listen to what he went through, wow, he really went through it. But without any further ado, let's bring him on here now. Matt, thanks so much for coming. Well, no problem. Matt, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I'm from a small town in Ohio, and uh, I'm 39 years old, uh, blue collar fabrication welder worker. I have five children and a wife, and they're all really good. And uh, just a uh, simple dude. That's about well, it. I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit there. You're not a simple dude, but (laughs) you're just being humble. That's all it is. Matt, you've always had a love of wolves. Have your encounters with dogmen affected that? No, not really. I actually uh, own a wolf hybrid. Speaking of wolf hybrids, you had a female wolf hybrid with you when you had these encounters. What can you tell us about her? Uh, Her name was Crystal. And she was a hybrid uh, gray wolf with German Shepherd. She was almost pure, pure white uh, with a little bit of beige in her. And then uh, her eyes were a golden orange, just like a typical wolf's. Uh, she was a great dog, very uh, protective of me and my brothers growing up. And uh, uh, she was very very good i mean she had the the qualities of a wolf for sure but also the qualities of a german shepherd which i think it worked out pretty good it was one of the best dogs i ever owned in my life so, listening to you describe her she sure does sound like she was a great dog a yeah. really good one yeah. you had your first in you had your first encounter in the summer of 86 in the woods near the village of savona ohio how much time did you spend in the woods back then uh, it was nine nineteen ninety six in July, and it was hot. And as kids, that's really all we had to do was grow up there, and just the woods was our thing. That we built forts back there, jump dirt bikes and bikes, and just we did everything you think of. We at, for at the time that we were doing that, we like playing survival. So we would always get our backpacks full of just odds and ends stuff to think of what we would need to be on our own as kids, you know, 12 years old, 13. And we just had a good time. 
built little fires back there and played in the cornfields that were around the woods and uh, it was just that's all I really had to do in that little small town. So that's a great way to grow up, spending all that time out in the woods. Yeah, if more kids grew up that way, the world would be a much better place. Speaking of that first encounter, it had a positive dogman related element to it, and it also had really bad ones as well. Knowing it could have left you with somewhat positive views of dogmen or monstrous views of them, how do you view them? Well, I had a taste of both, so I don't, you know, like we had discussed, it could have been the case of good cop, bad cop type deal, and I can see dogmen working together like that. I, you know, the. It's weird after I got done talking to you because I never really put a thought to it about the the brown one, as far as it probably could be playing. But I also still have this sneaky suspicion that it was a young one. But and not knowing what you know the ways of what dogmen typically do from what I've heard from other encounters, which is scared the crap out of people. <laughs> but I got a taste of both, so. It was, um, my thoughts are I, kind of open still. Like, I don't want to go out searching for one. I know what they're capable of and what could they do, and I can only imagine. But, uh, yeah, I don't think you can have one as a pet, that's for sure. Or a buddy, for that matter. That's pretty much what I think about them. Yeah, definitely not a pet. I don't see that happening. Maybe somewhat of an amicable relationship where, okay, that's you over there and this is me over here. But as far as patting its head and play fetch and all that stuff, yeah, not going to happen. Uh, but I don't know what they fetch for you, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. Fetch me a deer, yeah. buddy. <laughs> Might come back with a leg. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. All right, Matt, you've got a lot to unpack for us. So please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, it was um, July, I think mid-July, 1996. I was 12, and my brother was 12. He's my stepbrother, and my other brother was older than me. He was my stepbrother. But we lived outside of the woods. We was probably about, I'd say, a couple football fields that we lived from. it, And where we lived at, there was two horseshoes that they called the horseshoes. So you could turn into it and basically you got houses that you drive by and then yards and you know, circle around like a horseshoe fashion. And in between the horseshoe fashion was a woods that went back along a torn out railroad track. Well, that torn out railroad track also ran alongside a, uh, I guess it was, it's Provico feed grain that was there at one point. I don't know if it's still there. I don't think it is. But there was also, back in the day before I was even born, there was like a little grocery store that ran along the railroad too. And that got turned into a big giant house. But, <clears throat> so the w woods had a runoff pond from the grain bin that was right behind the pond. And you would see all kinds of stuff out there, frogs, everything. People even drop their goldfish out there and they you'd see goldfish. And so it was the woods would go along the torn out tracks for miles. And like I still don't know where the hell those railroads laid to, led to. But I know also there's like woods that went along the I would say the west going towards west. And then south and west, so it was kind of like a uh, an angle of woods that would go along the whole big, huge, long trail going west. And then the railroad tracks were going south and north. <clears throat> but we had huge mounds that were back there that led to trails that we had created, chopping out like branches and trees and roots out of the system so our bikes wouldn't get caught up in them and everything else. But there was a lot of brush and a lot of thickness toward the pond area. And we really never went around the pond area, <clears throat> but there was a trail that went through uh, going toward the West. So 
one day we were doing the whole survival game. It was like a Saturday, I think, either it was Saturday or Sunday. But <clears throat> we, I put a whole bunch of stuff in my book bag, and I was going to meet my two brothers back there in the woods with our neighbor, our neighbor girl. She was a Tom girl. <clears throat> She's like our sister. And uh, so we always hung out together. So I had Crystal with me, my uh, wolf hybrid. And we were going in there. And I had baloney in my backpack. And, but at first we were throwing stuff like everywhere. Like I would throw anything and she'd go and fetch it through the woods and she'd just come back trolloping and all that kind of stuff. And then the one time she didn't come back and I was like, well, okay. I was sitting there looking around for her, looking around for her. And then I happened to notice probably about, I'd say, so I was 12, and I was probably a good five, seven, five, eight then. And I noticed as I'm walking around, something that was like, it looked like it was about 33 feet up. And there was brush all the way around it. And I noticed it looked like my dog, Crystal. But it was real dark brown. And it had a black stream line going down its muzzle. And... uh I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute, I did a double take and I just happened to say, well, that looks like, like crystal. What the world? And, you know, for me and for us, we saw animals back there all the time, including deer, raccoon, possum, and, you know, other people's dogs and neighbor's dogs and stray dogs and whatever basically came down the railroad track. <laughs> it was back here, but it always seen us and they'd either be friendly or they'd just move along. And as I'm looking at this thing, it, it looks at me and it looks at me just like my, my dog Zeta does at me when like it, she's enamored and wondering what I'm doing. And she's got yellow eyes, just like this one had yellow, like yellowish amber eyes, almost like fire, but not, but you could definitely tell as it looked at you popped out and I was like, well, there's another, another dog. And that's what I thought. So I reached in my backpack and got the baloney out. And I was like, well, while Crystal's out and about, I'm going to go ahead and just hook this little dude up with some baloney. <laughs> so I threw a piece of baloney over at it and I was watching it. And I grabbed a piece of baloney and I ate it and was showing it that it's okay or whatever to eat it. It's sniffing, it's doing its side to side motion up and down. And it's looking at me like, what'd you do? What's that? And like, it turned its head a little bit to the left or right. I can't remember which one, but cocked it at its head like a dog would. And I'm only seeing the head of this thing. And it was a massive head, even, you know, considered what the dogman encounters that I've heard and seen myself, the eight footer. <laughs> it's its eyes were probably like six inches apart and i was like this is a big dog <laughs> i don't know what kind of dog this is this is a big one and so like it got done sniffing and it seemed to eat and then it kind of showed its teeth but didn't like kind of like, it's like a half half show i don't know if you've ever seen dogs do that or not but it went down and it smelled the baloney and then all of a sudden it just started eating it and then apparently it liked it because it started moving out of the brush a little bit and it's i guess the head kind of was i don't know how to say it, like coned it just as it's coming out you can see it like getting a little bit bigger because you can see more details of the head and i seen a little bit of the neck at that point and i was like this is a little bit bigger than a normal what the hell is this thing i don't think this is a dog and I was like, it looks just like Crystal, but way bigger. And Crystal, she just looked like a wolf big time, like what you would see in the wild. And so I threw another piece of bologna at it, and I grabbed another piece. And I sat there and ate it, and it ate the other piece. And then I threw a couple more at it, and it started coming out further. And as it came out further, it was just almost all brown just dark brown and uh at this point in time you can see like the muscle definition and this is like one o'clock during the day so the, the sun is like literally bright but it's 
where we were at, it was kind of dark for, you know, as much brush was there. But you could see the definition of muscle on this bad boy. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is kind of creepy. What's going on here? And, you know, as it came out further and further, I threw another piece of bologna, like, to get it to kind of not come out any further because it was starting to freak me out. And as I was looking, it didn't have, like, it didn't have, like, paws like a dog would. It looked like a freaking super built up muscular like pit bull front legs but with hands like like all all the other encounters really like uh, the uh, raccoon hands but just beefy and i was I, I, at that point in time like, you know being a kid i didn't know what i was looking at you know but what i did think of at the time was that it looked like the american werewolf in london type wolf but like without looking crazy <laughs> and it it looked like it had a curious demeanor on it like it didn't seem like its defenses were up it, it seemed um i guess the word best word would be curious it just and it kind of just came out a little further and as it came out further then my all of a sudden my uh dog crystal she all just started bolting toward us and scared the crap out of me because she's just barking and growling behind us and she's got in front of me and as she got in front of me was growling and barking and her ears were cocked down and cocked back at an angle like she was i've never seen her like that either and she growled like something the devil would do or something and <laughs> this thing started showing its teeth and it growled a little bit and then next thing you know, the trees <laughs> in the distance, probably 30 yards away, started splitting. And I was like, what in the... And I'm sitting there trying to look at the trees in the back and looking at this thing in front of me and trying to get Crystal away. And then the trees... And it's getting closer toward me. And the, it's just... I just seen the massive black head just pop. It was so fast. I didn't even have time to say what in the, <laughs> and it was on me. It was right in front of me. And at that point in time, the brown one turned around, like almost like a, I don't know if you've ever seen a cat jump up and then shift its weight <laughs> to look back. And it seen that. And then it went up and it literally backed into me and was basically, it seemed like it was, I don't know if it was trying to protect me or what but that was the the sense i got out of it crystals in the meantime she's pulling on my jeans trying to get me to go and i'm just stuck where i'm at i didn't know what to do and what i'm looking at in front of the brown one is this giant <sighs> terminator looking steroided out black one with fur everywhere and it's big dog haunches and this calves on this thing was as big as my head and I'm just looking at this thing, I, wanting to cry, wanting to just anything I can think of. But I was so stunned and shocked at the same time. I just <laughs> like, what do you do when it's something that you see now that I can relate that one to would be like the Van Helsing werewolf, the black one. And then the brown one looked like the brown one and the Van Helsing one, but different. And then the black one had a lot more fur than the one in the Van Helsing. But its eyes were, oh my God, them, them, those eyes were like fire. Like, it was, I, looking at it, you couldn't look at it without, like, actually looking down. To look at it was to, like, feel like certain death, to be honest with you. That was the the fear, the, the feeling I got, like, I, I'm going to die if this, if I look at this thing in the eyes or anywhere near its face and... Uh, the brown one just kind of kicked me back away from it. And the black one, it, it, it resembled like a parent scoring a child or like somebody just yelling at another one. And it's kind of like taking it, you know, and 
Crystal pole means she's starting to drag me at that point in time because I've seen her drag deers. She had two deers that she's dragged out of the woods before for our family and left it in the backyard for us. And I, and I guess that was the perk of having a wolf hybrid. But <laughs> she had started dragging me out and I, I kind of caught like conscious or whatever. And I was probably about 20 or 30 yards from the exit of the woods and I freaking bailed like as fast as I could. And <laughs> Crystal was right next to me as I was running away and I finally got to my house. I didn't even stop running. I finally got there. That was the end of the first encounter. I didn't see nothing or hear nothing after that for a minute. So it was, um, I don't even think it was a week later. Not even. Maybe a couple of days. Uh, I'm at sleeping at nighttime. And this is in regards to the second encounter. And it must must attract me back to my house. Being only like two football fields away, I'm sure, from everything else that I've heard on other encounters, that's what happens. It sensed me and smelled me and probably smelled my dog and tracked me back to my house. And, like, as I was sleeping, I felt like I was getting talked to in my head. And, like, I was having a weird dream, like, don't, <laughs> like I don't know how to explain it. Like, to, like, don't come into the woods. The woods aren't safe right now. And yada, yada, yada. And I woke up to a tapping on glass. And there it was, the brown one. And I could see it almost... <laughs> We had a light on the left side as I'm looking out of my window. We had a light on my neighbor's house and it wasn't directly shining on it, but it was like a a glare off that light that you could see it without it being in the light. So I knew it was the brown one and it was almost like it was talking to me in my sleep. And it was weird because I, I know it sounds crazy, but. That's what it felt like. And I, I didn't even feel like I was in danger with that brown one. And I, I kind of freaked out. And I didn't know what to do. And I ran to my mom and dad <laughs> in their room. They told me I was having a nightmare. And it was the werewolf movies that I need to stop the werewolf movies. And I'm like, I have only watched like two or three of them in my life. Howling being one of them, which scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. And... Uh, oh, I want to say Silver Bullet and American Werewolf in London. Those are the ones as a kid I was like, I never watched. I watched them one time and never did one and watched them again. It just scared the crap out of me. But I went back to my room when mom and dad told me to go back to my room and they weren't there. It wasn't there. And then they, they just kept telling me it was a dream. And I'm like, no, this was real. I'm telling you, it was, <laughs> they, they, they argued with me for a while and they thought I was crazy. And, um, I told my brothers about it, told my neighbor about it. And they all did said I was nuts and it was just another dog and just, I'm messing with them, which I kind of can't blame him because I was a jokester back in the day and <laughs> yeah, being an immature 12 year old and just growing up with them and stuff. But that was the end of my second encounter. My third encounter with them was at nighttime again. And <laughs> this, it, it was um, way worse than any other ones. Um, I was sitting there sleeping. And again, felt like I was, this time I felt like really weird and scared, like something was wrong. And you just get that sensation of like something's bad and it's about to happen. And it woke me up out of a dead sleep. And as I'm looking, (laughs) the, the, uh, I kind of shaking a little bit now that I'm really getting into this. Uh, I see the black one and it's huge. And 
it's literally staring right at me and you can see the fog from its breath and it was a cool night and its hand was like a third of my window and its head was the rest of it and as it like it would lick the window and it, i could see the eyes just glowing at me and then it licks the window <laughs> it licks the fog right off that window and it's just smell smelling me and i uh, don't know what to do on that one I, I freaked out and went back to mom and dad's room again and dad got up and looked and it wasn't there and it just uh that one threw me for a loop because it basically you know i heard the growl and it rattled the window it almost like it rattles your the the very core of your body when you it happens and the fourth one wasn't so bad but it was scary and i was sleeping again and the brown werewolf or dog man whatever you want to call it basically was there and like it i swear it sounds weird but it's like it was talking to me and it said that you don't have to worry no more we're getting ready to leave the woods will be fine and safe that's the vibe i was getting in my head like it was weird and the black one pushed it over and kind of gave me this sneer and growl and i disappeared <laughs> and it's pretty much the gist of it those were all my encounters that's way too much for any kid to have to deal with for any adult to deal with but when you're that young yeah you just don't handle stressful situations nearly as well as an adult would but like i said even if you're an older adult i mean how do you take those experiences and deal with them in a healthy way yeah that's not easy at all matt i've got a question for you from fiber geek and fiber geek wants to know matt do you think the big one was a male protecting a female or maybe a parent protecting a child i never thought about the aspect of a female uh, during the story i likened it to a parent protecting a child it's the only thing i can think of because of how crystal was acting toward it is the literal only reason i can think of that it did what it did but it could be just me being in the mere presence of it i don't know or it could have been both i mean i try to put myself in the shoes of the black one and if i would have saw or sensed my young one or my woman you know or my female in some sort of danger i would have definitely done the same thing to you know that i really think about it so it very well could have been both or one or the other as far as that goes did you notice any anatomical features on the brown one that might have given you the impression it might have been a female no i didn't notice any of that that um you know in my recollection females you know as far as dogs as i'm looking at it as a kid females always had their um i guess aerials or you know <laughs> their their teats that have like six of them you know three on each side going down toward their stomach area and that's you know that's where i would have thought it would have been if you know, i just i didn't notice anything like that i was just too enamored with what the hell was in front of me <laughs> Oh, of course. Yeah, if you have all that going on, looking for teats is the last thing that's going to be in your mind. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to female dogmen, it can go both ways. Some female dogmen have two teats. Others have multiples. So there really is no rhyme nor reason on that. Looks like I have another question for you from Elaine Isabel. And that question is, couldn't your dad see any lick marks on your window? 
Well, yeah, probably, but we had dogs and all that kind of stuff. So they were always on our windows or, you know, as out in the country, there's dirt on your windows regardless, if you, especially since we live next to a field. So, I mean, a very well cove, I, that, that's not something I would have, uh, I mean, you see Paul marks on our glass and all the time. So that's just not something that was strange to us. Now I understand. I've got another question for you from Shannon Humanizer. And Shannon's question is where did this happen at? What state? Uh, it happened in Savona Village in Ohio. All right. When we had that first conversation, Matt, I was really on the fence about whether to pose that possibility, to raise that possibility to you about it possibly being a situation where those two were playing good dog men, bad dog men on you, that maybe they're in on that together, but I don't really see any benefit to them doing that. If they would have done that to manipulate you into letting your guard down, that'd be one thing. And then later, after the fact, do something that would exploit that, exploit the fact that you'd lowered your guard. But nothing like that ever happened. So the more I think about it, I just doubt that was the case. I think that brown one actually was displaying altruistic behavior, trying to look out for your best interests. I really do. That, like I said, that it's kind of what I gathered from it. Like it didn't seem like it was wanting to harm me. When it showed, I, I showed it like, you know, I guess kindness in a way, like you giving free food out to somebody and not showing any type of ill will towards something or someone. I, if they're this intelligent creature that I've heard from other people on other encounters and as far as when we had discussed, you said they were super intelligent and I, I feel like they're intelligent myself, so I don't see any reason. Oh, they definitely are super intelligent. Yeah, definitely. I've got another question for you from Blood Viper, and his question is, do you think your dad denied it trying to protect you? I don't know. To be honest with you, I know he made me watch a lot of werewolf movies afterwards. I don't know if he liked it because I freaked out about him or what, but he might have probably tried to desensitize me with all watching them because that was what he would do all the time for a good month. Huh. That is strange. Maybe he was trying to, in some way, desensitize you after all. It's hard to say. That's a good way to do it, because them, them movies back in the day when I was a kid, you scared the crap out of me. So, and then with, you have those experiences. Yeah, those were... And to see that's what's messed up, it's like I really... I stopped even trying to talk about that kind of stuff, because, you know, when you're your own dad, your own mom, your own brothers, and your neighbor, he was all close to you, tell you, you're just full of crap, and you're just joking. And I was like, I don't know, I promise you, I'm not joking. Literally, I wish that, you know, it's to the point where like, I almost wish I had a claw mark or something just to prove I'm like, like man, I got sliced luck. <laughs> I don't know why you can't believe me. But after a while, you know, I'm almost 40, 12 years old. That's <laughs> 28 years of really not being able to talk about it. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. I call that a prison without walls. So many eyewitnesses go through that. They have these horrendous encounters with dog men, and unfortunately, they can't reach out to their significant others in a lot of cases or their family because they become a punchline if they do. If I had a nickel for every time I was told that someone told their significant other about a bad dog man encounter and they were made fun of, and then after that, at every family get-together, they become the punchline. Family members poke fun at them for their quote-unquote werewolf encounter. Yeah, I'd be a really rich man. And if it doesn't, it just doesn't get more disgusting than that. That's just horrible. It really is. You told us about how much time you like to spend in the woods before these encounters happen, but after the encounters did happen... Did you spend any time in the woods, or did you just totally swear off going back in? Mm, it was, uh, let's see, it happened. 
yeah, it happened. Um, and the time frame, which was weird, from 96, of summer of 96 to the fall of 97, that was the last encounter we had. And I really didn't go back there too much, if at all. It just didn't, you know, feel right. But after that last encounter, basically, you know, I didn't know if it was trying to be legit, tell me that they were no longer going to be in the area or something. I noticed we didn't have any deer anymore. Like, nobody hunted back there no more. I know that for sure. Um, yeah, there was no deer ever. So I know those were probably taken out. And the, it must have went dry or on the food source, you know. I mean, there was there's a pond there, yeah, but there was a lot of wildlife that was missing, you know. We used to see a bunch. It was teeming with wildlife in our woods. And we had cornfields one side, beans on another. So they had an ample amount of food supply anywhere they went as far as the animals. So there would be no reason why they would not be there. So, but uh, during the fall time, we started going back there again because we would do, you know, our bike riding, our sledding back here because of all the drifts and stuff. And, well, they were never there anymore. And you could definitely tell because the trees had no leaves. There was no brush, no nothing. You could actually look through the woods. And, yeah, we never, nobody got any freakiness, weird feelings. I sure didn't. And, you know, the first initial couple times I did, but after that, it was really a big issue. I think I've dealt with it the best because it happened while I was young. I've had a lot of years to, you know, stew on it. Well, that can work for you or against you. In some instances, it works to your favor, but yeah, there are quite a few instances where it doesn't, unfortunately. And... Talking about all the game that was depleted, people ask me all the time if it's a common thing for eyewitnesses to report seeing more than one dog man together. And I tell them, no, it's not a common thing. It's not unprecedented. Credible eyewitnesses do report seeing more than one dog man together, but I think that's got to be a very rare thing. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you the same thing I tell them. If you think about the daily caloric requirements of a dog man, just imagine if you have more than one in an area, how much quicker all the resources are going to be depleted. I mean, if two dogmen, three dogmen especially, or more stayed in one particular area for any period of time, I don't think there would be anything left to eat. So that's why I think they almost always make it a habit to just hang out alone because that's not that big of a threat by doing that compared to sticking around in numbers you said it yourself that there weren't any more deer the game just pretty much disappeared well it's clear that at least for a certain period of time you had two dogmen in that area so that could very easily be why very easily be why i would say Gotta, subconsciously that's definitely why <laughs> well, uh, say. you know thinking about it and all that kind of stuff as i got older about a lot of things i had a lot of time to uh, get some different perception and clarity on a lot of this stuff no it definitely makes sense i've got another question for you from dennis theriault and dennis's question is how has this affected your life and your outlook on life not i don't think okay I guess kind of like uh, when I was younger, uh, I always used to use the the rage and the the seriousness and how the black one acted. I I guess I always kept that image and how it acted in my head whenever I came to like an altercation with a, with somebody in the human world when like they deserved it, like, they, like a fight or something, I would, <laughs> it almost be like imbibing the spirit of that black, the black one. And as I got older and I had children, 
I guess I imbibe the spirit of that one. Cause that's why I feel like that the brown one was, was it's it was like the half the size of it. You know, the black one had to be eight, eight and a half, nine feet. I don't know. At 12 years old, it's kind of hard to judge when something's towering over top of you and you're not really good at measurement math at that point in your life. <laughs> but, you know, as I got older, I have children of my own and I can only imagine what I'd do if somebody I didn't know was around my child. And I, I'm pretty sure I'd act like that. <laughs> Uh, protective in nature and I wouldn't mess around but other than that like it hasn't really affected me and it has to an extent there'd be times where I can let my dogs out in at night time and I can stare off in the in my yard and all of a sudden I feel like I see a black one but I know for a fact it's not there but that's about the only way I could I guess say it affected me but in reality, I don't think it has much. I learned from it more than anything. Well, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you learned a lot of things from that experience or those experiences. I've got another question for you from Blood Viper, and he wants to know, do you think that it was a family unit or a pack? I, I would tend to think it was a family unit. A pack would seem to be, I would say, at least four or five. And I, I only seen two. There could have been a mom. There could have been, I don't know if that was the mom. I would assume it's the dad as big as that thing was. I, I'd hate to see what the mom would look like, too, because I heard they're worse from all the other encounters. They're more vicious. But I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, that's normally not the case. Normally, the males are going to be more more prone to not necessarily violence, but uh, do violent displays, I guess, to try and get a rise yeah. out of you. Yeah. I've got another question for you from Kate Smith. And Kate wants to know, I know this is a weird question, but do dogmen have genitalia like a human man or like a dog? Now, I know you're not a researcher, so you wouldn't know this, and I'm not a researcher either. I just happen to know quite a few things about dogmen. So I'm going to answer this question for you, Kate, and let you know that normally their phallus looks like that of a dog's. I, I can say this for uh, from my point of view, and I was pretty much head level, I, I would assume. Uh, it had a big old hang dang. Um, yeah, uh, I'd say some uh, grapefruits. That's about it. Did you notice it swingers on the front or on the back? Uh, can you reiterate that? Sure. If you saw it swingers, did you see it when it turned around and had its back to you or from the front? Did you say fingers? Swingers. Testicles. Oh, <laughs> swingers. Okay, gotcha. I concur. Uh, well, I've seen it from the back. As I'm running away, I'm kind of keeping my head going back toward it and toward the exit of it. And just like how you see a Rottweiler's, um, it's pretty much the same premise. There it is. I knew I'd seen a question by someone that wasn't in all caps i just found it it's from tommy cooper and tommy wants to know do you think they're a harbinger of death uh, they're definitely capable of that um without a doubt in my mind they could from what i saw they could probably just tear a human in half and I mean, there's, as far as a harbinger, I don't think it's, it'll definitely bring you death if you call, I mean, if it calls for it, it'll bring you death. And I mean, if you confront it and challenge it, I'm sure you're probably going to die. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. You'd have to have one of the largest calibers they make to probably take this thing down. And I mean, probably four or five times. And I, that's assuming you, you can even have, the, the speed to shoot it before it gets to you. 
that and uh, put that bullet on target where it needs to go. So I mean, the, the way they make you feel, I'd be impressed if you ain't shaking four to five inches from each side. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, something like that standing in front of you that's giving you the impression that it wants to wipe you off the map, then yeah, it's really going to rattle you, definitely. It is. And because of the trauma from those experiences, we talked about this in our first conversation. That big black dog man, if it really wanted to kill you, there wasn't a thing that little brown one could have done to stop it. If it really wanted to do that, like I said in that first conversation, that brown one might have slowed it down just a little bit, but it definitely could not have stopped it. So every indication is that black one, it just wanted to get a rise out of you. That's a repeating MO with these guys. They'll do everything they can to make you think they want to eviscerate you. But when it comes down to it, you leave the experience without a heart, without a single scratch on your body. So please don't lose sight of that. Got a question for you from Camille Jonas. And Camille's question is, have you shared your story with your wife and children? If so, how have they responded? Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Uh-oh is right. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I've got a question for you from Camille Jonas. And Camille's question is, have you shared your story with your wife and children? If so, how have they responded? Uh, as far as my wife, no. I don't. And she's probably going to know tonight after this. And uh, she's probably going to think I'm crazy like I told her. Because I told her I was going to do your show. And I didn't tell her what it was about, but I said, you just think I'm crazy. And if he wants to use it for the show or whatever, then you'll find out. But um, as far as my kids now, it's kind of fun, though, to use um, a werewolf mask for um, to have fun with them. Because that's I, I found out that that really does strike fear into them when you do some pranks to them. So. Other than that, no, my kids would probably think I'm crazy. I just, um, like I said, kept it to myself. Understandably so. And like I said, it really is a shame it has to be that way, but it's totally understandable. And if your wife and kids do think you're crazy, I mean, that's on them. You know the truth. They don't. And that's why they feel the way they do if they do wind up thinking that you're crazy. So... Yeah, that's when it comes down to it. That's not a you problem. That's a them problem. Please remember that. I've got a question for you from Scott B. And Scott wants to know, have you ever been to Land Between the Lakes, LBL? Oh, no. Absolutely not. No, I don't want to. Nope. <laughs> Wrong guy. Not going. <laughs> I've heard too many stories about that place, and you're guaranteed to probably get hemmed up by one of them bad boys. Uh-uh. Yep. <laughs> as far as wanting to go, like it, it's the same premise of um, going out into the ocean, the deep sea ocean. And you're in the shark's kitchen. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely in their kitchen at that point in time. It's so secluded and desolate out there. I'm good. Yeah, a lot of bad things have happened out there. So mm -hmm. I get it. I understand. I've got another question for you from Cody Lusario. And Cody's question is, any guesses on how tall each dogman was? Um, as far as the brown one, it never really stood up fully. Um, I mean, as it did st try to stand up, it backed in toward me. Like, having its, like it had its arms out. Like, um, and I was behind it. And Crystal was underneath my legs at that point in time when the black one come out. And the black one literally, oh, man, I'm telling you, it's probably eight and a half, nine feet tall. And then I'd say the brown one hunched over was every bit of four and a half, five feet tall as it was hunched over. Um, 
if it stood up, I imagine it was probably maybe six and a half, seven. But I don't know for sure. That's pretty big, but yeah, compared to the black one, not that big at all. I've got another question for you from Blood Viper, and he wants to know, seeing that at such a young age, how did it affect your going out in the forest in the area? Uh, it didn't affect me so much so in probably 1998 and above. Um, the whole, pretty much the whole year, rest of 96 and the whole year of 97, it kind of, it kind of got to me, but like I said, it was during the fall that I had the last encounter and we went out there during when it was snow time. So I would say December, December, January area. That's when we, I started going back into the woods. Um, I, I felt like the brown one didn't lie to me or if that's, you know, what happened. Because like I said, it felt like it was talking to me when I was in my sleep. And I don't know if that's legit or if that's a, a clairvoyance or something. I, I don't know if that's God. I don't know. It could be a plethora of things for all I know. But all I know is they weren't back there anymore after that. Thank goodness for that. The brown one definitely helped you out. But, yeah, I'm just glad that both of them left. Because if even the brown one hung around, oh, yeah, it's really unsure to say what would have happened even down the road. The brown one hung out. I'd just be afraid to get a scratch and it smelled my blood and it really want me. You know, even that would tried to help me and or did help me or whatever, I'd still be worried about being lunch. And oh, sure, and that's understandable. It. Because even my wolf that I have now, my hybrid, if she sees or smells raw meat, you know, next to her. Uh, regular diet of dog food if she smells the raw meat when I pull that out to give to her her, her eyes go different just like the black ones was so I know for a fact that would have been me lunch meat to the brown one if I ever you know felt like it wanted to eat me it had blood or anything on me I'm pretty sure it would act just like a wolf and come after me I really doubt that because if these guys had trouble feeding themselves, that'd be one thing. But if you think mountain lions are deer killing machines, these guys make mountain lions look like rank amateurs. So like I said, they don't have any trouble feeding themselves. And if you think about it, why is a dog man going to want to eat a nasty tasting human when they could go and just dispatch a deer and enjoy venison? So I can appreciate you feeling that way because of the fear factor, but... Yeah, I mean, the evidence, after speaking with thousands and thousands of dogman eyewitnesses, the evidence points in a different direction. So, please keep that in mind. Did you suffer from insomnia because of the trauma, number one, and also those conversations, those mind-speak, seemingly mind-speak conversations in your sleep? Or were you still able to sleep fairly well? Oh, I, I have insomnia to this day. I, uh, I, uh, probably get about on a lucky night, four and a half hours of sleep, but it's interrupted sleep. I catch myself. I wake myself up like by talking in my sleep, just weird stuff. I've had, uh, it was I don't know, not even, not even four or five months ago. I had a dream, felt like I was back at the, uh, back when I was 12 years old again and just different aspects of that dream of what happened just but i know what really happened you know there's just different scenarios that play along in dreams you have no control over but yeah it was like three or four months ago that i had a dream where i was back there again but it happened differently wow i was hoping that all the nightmares would be a thing of the past now but unfortunately yeah sounds like that's not the case Hopefully before too long, they won't keep popping up, but I guess time will tell them that. I've got a comment from Scott B. in reference to that question he asked about the LBL. He says, I live three hours from LBL, the land between the lakes. I fish tournaments there quite a lot. Never seen one. So something to keep in mind there. Pretty fortunate. Yeah, definitely. I mean... 
if I was you, I'd just concentrate on fish instead of looking out in the woods and trying to look for something. Just do your thing and fish, and uh, you'll be lucky. Well, life does go on. I mean, you're a young guy. You're a really young guy, Matt, and I hope at some point, you know, not too much weight on a young back, but I hope at some point down the road you are comfortable enough to head back into the woods. Again, baby steps. Don't oh, just well, rush out there, but I hope you I'm can. in the woods now. It's just when – he was talking about the land between legs, the LBL, which is absolutely famous for cryptids, period, let alone the dogmen. And me being already familiar with the dogmen, I don't want to even know what else is out there, let alone a whole bunch of dogmen sightings have encountered out there. I, nah, I'm good. I just know when not to go into another's kitchen. Being able to head back into the woods is one thing. Being able to head back into the woods and actually enjoy yourself, that's something totally different. When you do head back into the woods now, can you enjoy yourself at all, or are you just on edge the whole time? Uh, yes and no. You know, um, I was always, you know, when uh, I have 100 friends, 100 buddies and stuff like that, you know, it's something to enjoy, but it's also something you, you know, you're acting when you're hunting and you're acting as if you're a predator yourself. So you have to be on edge. You have to be aware of your surroundings in the same sense. So I've always kind of had that going into the woods, irregardless whether I was seeing them or not. Um, I just, I guess it's sixth sense to always be when you're always out in the woods anyway you have wild animals constantly you know i'm not sitting there thinking about a dog man at all, any point in time there's other animals out there that could hurt you and so you'd have to be a fool to go to the woods and not necessarily be on edge but at least be aware of your surroundings that is what i typically do i wouldn't say i'm on edge anymore when i like i was when i was a kid that's good. That's really good. Yeah, it sounds like you can enjoy your time in the woods. Of course, you're not letting your guard down. You're staying aware of your surroundings, which, just like you said, that's always a very good idea. And as strange as it might sound to some people, I head into the woods myself. I mean, I go when I can because of my work schedule. It's not very easy. But when I get time, when I can, I like to go for nice long walks through the woods. I've got a woods here, a big woods behind me that it does have dog men. It does have Sasquatch. And I head out unarmed, as strange as it might sound. Some of these people where I see posting comments that if you go into the woods unarmed, you're just a lunatic. If you only knew how many times I've headed into the woods and walked for miles without anyone else with me, without a gun, and here I am. I mean, if you talk about a chess piece, if the dog men, <laughs> if they wanted me, they'd have me dead to rights. And I truly, because of all the dog men eyewitnesses I help, I'm like the, the queen on the chessboard. I guess probably even the king on the chessboard. If they could take me out, then, you know, they could affect all these eyewitnesses and I'd be one less person out there trying to help them recover. So, yeah, I mean, if they were nearly as dangerous as it's all too easy to make them out to be, then, yeah, I just flat out wouldn't be here. Am I going to say that they're safe to be around? No, I'm not going to say that any more than anything out there is safe to be around. Because, yeah, you have deviant examples of whatever, you name it, and you're going to find deviant examples. There are deviant people, serial killers, who will kill you as soon as look at you. So how could you say that? That right there is why I'm not going to say that. I will say this. You being out in the woods where there's known dog men, you got some big swangers like yourself. Like well, thanks for... The black dog, man, I've seen. You got some big swangers yourself, buddy, with no, uh, no sidearm. The way I look at it is I want to be in that woods with a sidearm. And if they do get me, which it's possible they could, I'm still going to try and put a bullet in that thing and leave a mark in it before I go. I'm not going to sit there and not let it get uh, uh, some sort of revenge on it, I guess. They better hope they get me good. I'm 6'3 and 300 pounds, so 
<laughs> Big snack. Understand, Matt, that in a lot of cases, these guys will bluff charge you with no intentions on following through and, and actually attacking you. So if you're going to fire a one, I always tell people, please be sure that you're just convinced that you're going to die anyway. Because if this is a bluff charge and you shoot one that didn't intend to actually take you out, if it was just a bluff charge, if you shoot it, now things really get sideways. So please keep that in mind. The way I think about it is if I just approach it and, and from all the encounters that I've listened to over this past, oh, I can't even remember how long now, but all the encounters I've listened to, I think it really debates. It really depends on your spirit, who you are, how you react. And, you know, I'm assuming if you do shoot it, it's probably going to get you or do some malicious things to mess with you. All kinds of things can go wrong with that. You know, but it's, you know, having a sidearm regardless to me gives me a peace of mind. And that's all I really need when you're in the woods is have a peace of mind. Um, knowing that they're an apex predator and we aren't the apex predator, that kind of sucks. But in the same sense, I, you know, I'm well adjusted to it i know if they want to kill me they'll get me regardless and that's anybody for that matter so you know you the one that helped me out really point that out well, months ago when i listened to one of your shows you sat there and said well if the dog man wanted to get you it'd get you <laughs> and i was like you know as simple as that is it's so true because <laughs> there's nothing you can do to stop that thing that's right. It's good to understand that. I had a conversation with a guest named Frank. I forgot his last name, but I think he was on episode 332. He's a really nice guy who really knows a lot about the woods. And he told me that he initially had plans on heading out and trying to bag a dog man. And he walked me through all these steps that he had carefully planned out and thought out to see that through. And then I brought it to his attention. Okay, I can appreciate you wanting to do that for the reasons you laid out for me, but understand those, those things that you just laid out for me, that is not going to be enough to protect you from one of these guys ripping you apart. He didn't realize these guys climbed trees and had other abilities and other things that they do and do awfully well that would make it really foolish to try to actually go out and hunt one, to bag one. So after I laid all this information out for him, yeah, he didn't have any interest. At least he told me he didn't have any interest in trying to actually hunt one after that. So they're an ambush predator. That's what they do. I mean, they have that similarity to a wolf and a wolf pack. Um, and it's mixed with human, maybe, whatever. Or it looks like a human. I mean, it's obviously bipedal. And it has the arms of a human being, the chest like one, and hands somewhere. You know, it's got a posable thumb. I'm assuming it has some sort of humanity in it, or, you know, I know it's an animal. But mixed with that kind of stuff, it's going to be smarter than the average wolf. So that's something that you don't want to mess with. And that guy would be in fatal error, I'm assuming, if he tried to do that. Oh, I'm sure he would. Yeah, that's there's just no future in trying to hunt dogmen. There yeah. really isn't. Yeah. And also something else to consider. Let's say you go out and you do shoot at one. Maybe you wound one and you get away. What about the next group of people or the next person that heads into that area and runs into that dogman? What's going to happen to that person? So, yeah, that's also something to consider. Yep. Yeah. That would not be good for them people. No, it wouldn't. Not at all. I've got a comment from... Actually, you know what? I'm going to back up so I don't skip this question from Squatchin Grandmama. And her question is, how close to Youngstown, Ohio was Matt when he had his encounter? Uh, this one is... Uh... I think Youngstown, Ohio, is up north for me. 
I can't remember how far it is. But this one's in Dark County, Ohio. Um, it's southwest Ohio. It's about 40 to 45 minutes from Dayton, Ohio. And I know there was a lot of uh, Germantown uh, encounters that happened in Ohio, from what I've been told and seen and did research on. And that was a little close home to me because I'll have a lot of family in Germantown myself. Yeah, there are a lot of encounters that happen around there in and around Germantown. I've got a question, or actually a comment from Fiber Geek. He says, you showing kindness and sharing your baloney probably saved you. And I can appreciate Fiber Geek, Fiber Geek feeling that way, but I don't agree. I don't think that, I think if you wouldn't have thrown the baloney out, I don't think it really matters. You wouldn't have been harmed either way. Because if one of these guys wanted to harm you, then throwing a slice or two or 10 slices of bologna out there that's not going to stop them from taking you out so i appreciate the the idea that fiber geek put out there but i definitely disagree with that uh, it could have been a number of factors in all actuality i mean I, I, you know who you are spiritually kindness i mean it there, who knows what the what can really go on if just with hundreds and thousands of captures and encounters and stuff there's so many different people that have so many different things that are alike yet different and they could be bored and want to mess with you they could be a, a bad <laughs> a dog man and just say you know what let's do this let's get them there, all kinds of factors can work in against you or or with you just depends really on the situation, scenario, and everything. I'm assuming I got the feel for, I guess, good cop, bad cop, or maybe the parent protecting the child, or what. I don't know. Uh, I got the both sides of it. So I don't know if that helped me out being better because I can only imagine if it was all bad. I don't think I could have came back from that, you know, um, just seeing that eight. Eight and a half, nine footer was just, oh yeah, that'll, yeah. But anyway. We understand. We do understand. If you look at your living room ceiling, well, for most people, that's eight feet. So mm -hmm. add a foot to that, and that'll kind of give you an idea of what Matt's talking about when he says a nine footer. That's up there. That's awfully tall. And if you find yourself face to face with something like this, that looks like the worst monstrosity out of your worst nightmare, that's that tall. Number one, it's so traumatic just to see something that looks that way. And then compounding the trauma is how big this guy was. So yeah, that's just going to send you into overload. I don't care who you are. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the Bible even talks about Nephilim and giants and stuff like that and, and how the fallen ones came down and corrupted every creature. So I don't know. Um, they very well could be a Nephilim. They very well could be a natural um, God-made creature. Or uh, I'm assuming that's what it is. I mean, even Egypt had Anubis. And Anubis looked pretty close to some of these dogman encounters that I've heard over the years. Anubis, in almost every portrayal in hieroglyphs on pyramids or in tombs, Anubis has hominid-style legs, not digitigrade-style legs. So I'm not really sure what, what if any, correlation between dogmen and Anubis there might be. But that does kind of throw a monkey wrench into just being able to point at Anubis and saying, okay, well, Anubis must have been a dog man that people saw for that reason. Sheila Kelly made a comment. She says, I'm in Vermont. If anyone knows of any in Vermont, great show. Thanks for joining, Sheila. I appreciate it. And then Blood Viper has a comment. He says, Matt, many thanks for sharing your experiences with us. And I agree. Ain't no problem. It's kind of nice to 
get it out after 28 years of silence. It's always a good thing to be able to get something like this out. Now, not to beat a dead horse, but like I told you before, if that black one wanted to harm you, it definitely would have. But I don't want someone to get it twisted into thinking that I'm saying, like I said before, that all dogmen are safe to be around because the black one didn't want to harm you, that no dogmen in that situation would. I'm not saying that because, yeah, I fully believe that there are dogmen out there that are dangerous to be around. I do believe there are dogmen out there that will kill you if they get a chance. But that, again, goes back to the whole fact that there are deviant examples of anything that you might run into. So you really never know if the dogman you encounter is a dangerous one, is a, a belligerent one that is going to just rip you apart as soon as look at you or not. So something to keep in mind. Well, I sure as hell didn't go near that window when it was licking it. <laughs> Don't blame you. If you can freaking reach through the window and get to me, which you probably very well could have, but I was I was against my wall and I was six feet away. So if he had a six foot arm span, then he could have snatched me up quick. <laughs> I, I know that for a fact. That holy crap! Just the it sure thought that if it wanted to get me, it can get me. <laughs> it sure could have. Yeah, definitely. I've got another question for you from Stella Farrell, and Stella wants to know. Matt, did your dog act funny after the encounter? Yeah. Yeah, Crystal was, um, she didn't really leave my side. Like, Crystal was, me and her, man, she was, she was like a sister or something. I don't know. She she didn't leave my side all the time. Like, she would be by my door or end my bed or right in the lane next to me underneath my bed. Um, yeah, she, she was real protective of me, Ben. Um, there was a few times when we started going back in the woods that she would be hesitant. And there was a time when we went back here and it was right at the beginning. She'd start pulling my jeans to like pull me back out. And oh, I listened to her every time because you know, she's got the big, beautiful wolf ears, and me, I'm just a dumb kid. And I'd, I'd walk back out and see if she grabbed my jeans, and I wouldn't mess around. But, you know, she, uh, she acted funny for a minute. It sure sounds to me like she was a real keeper. You were so fortunate to have her. Yeah, she was the best dog that we had. And she was probably about 160 pounds. That's how big she was. And pure white, pure muscle, beautiful, just a beautiful mane on her. And unfortunately, when she had puppies, uh, she became uncontrollably protective of them. Like my mom and dad couldn't get near the puppies. We couldn't go near the puppies. And um, she broke down our front screen door when it was summertime she broke our front screen door down getting through to go after uh, a girl who was uh i think she was 16 or 17 at the time she's a a big junior type girl in high school her name was uh adrian and she used to like throw sticks at my dog when she was chained up in the back and enjoying the sun and stuff and she got her revenge on her. She thought she was either protecting them or what, but she was just driving by on a bike and she pulled her all the way off the bike by her leg, drew a massive amount of blood off of her. And yeah, we had to get rid of Crystal, unfortunately, but she went to a big, big, huge, nice farm where she could run around. Wow. So sorry to hear that. Yeah. She was, uh, we had it for six years. I want to say six or seven, something like that. So farmer ended up having her for three years, I think. And then she passed. But she, we all bawled like babies. She was a great dog. Yeah, sounds like it. Unless you get on her bad side. Well, she, she had that wolf in her. So she didn't play around when it comes to protection and never seen her lose a dog fight. I know that. She was really awesome at it. 
And oh, like sure I said, she was. She dragged deer from the woods <laughs> to our back porch twice. I, <laughs> I don't know if that was like a gift or something. I don't I have no clue, but it was pretty cool seeing her drag a whole freaking 200 pound deer back. It definitely sounds like she was a real deal. Mm hmm. Yeah, she definitely she was. was. She liked it. Like, uh, there was a movie that came out. Um, uh, Blood Moon or Bad Moon? I think it's called Bad Moon. Oh yeah, and that German Shepherd that was in there. She was just like that German Shepherd, which used to make me miss her a lot when I see that movie. That German Shepherd was awesome in that movie, and she was just like her, just a little bit more rougher around the edges, so to, so to speak. That movie came out all. Let's see now. When did it come out? I think in the. Yeah, I think the early 90s. So it didn't come out. Late 90s. Was it the late 90s? I'm not sure. I think it was early 90s. It wasn't that long after you had that first encounter or the group of encounters. Did you watch that right after it came out, or is that something that you stumbled upon years after the fact? Right, that was something we stumbled upon years after the fact. When I saw it, though, <laughs> it, it, uh, it creeped me out. I know that when he chained himself up to that tree to try to stop him from eating his own sister. And then all of a sudden you seen the full effect of it. And it was almost like a nasty little flashback. And that was one of the things that kind of got in my brain. Like, man, I think could have done the same thing to me. Like it followed her home. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, of course, try not to think about that too much. Oh, that was a kid then when I saw that kind of stuff. I'm totally at peace with what, you know, goes on or could go on. So That's good. That's really good. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Matt. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Um, I wouldn't let it bother people that hasn't had the encounter. Or even if you had the encounter, I wouldn't let it bother you too much. Like. Just like Vic says, if it wanted to get you, it'll get you. And, you know, being in the woods is something that all creatures on this earth should be able to enjoy. <clears throat> and I do enjoy going to the woods. Like I said, I'm just, I'm not on edge. I'm just making sure I know my surroundings when I'm in there. Um, and the woods are for everybody. And... Dogmen, I have to think, know that too, or there'd be a lot more people being killed by them. And yeah, just, I don't think they're, if they were super malicious and super um, just dangerous, you, nobody could ever go in the woods. You wouldn't want to. Our population, human population, would be depleted highly. <laughs> Lord That's right. There are. Yeah, if that was the case, I wouldn't have spoken with thousands upon thousands of people who have had direct encounters with these guys. So, and yeah, something to keep in mind. But, Matt, I can't thank you enough for coming on and not only sharing the details of those experiences, but answering all these questions that the listeners had. I really appreciate it. It's no big deal. Everybody needs to know about it. I just yes, they do. 28 years to say something. Well, better late than never. So we're glad My you did it. I don't know about it now. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good thing. I just hope that she acts responsibly and doesn't try to, to rib you or, or give you a hard time about it. Yeah, me too. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll see. But please remember, if you ever need help down the road, if you start to regress on your your dealings with these experiences, just please send me a message, let me know, and by all means, I'll call you back and I'll find out what's giving you trouble. So you're never going to be alone with this again. I surely appreciate it, Vic. And thank you for your time and thanks for listening and letting me get my story out there. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to do it. And for the listeners, again, thank you so much for listening to the show, for supporting the show. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I really do. But 
Thanks again so much for listening and have a great night.